Is God real? Are the stories in the Bible true? I need answers. Welcome to A Closer Look with the Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church. I'm Fred Jeff Smith, pastor of Shiloh, and I'm very happy that you chose to spend the next hour with us as we delve into the study of God's Word. We can't do what we don't know. Here at Shiloh, we want to spend time studying the Word so that we can rightly apply the Word to our daily living and make a difference in our community and in our world for Jesus Christ. Won't you join us now for a closer look into God's Word? I want to call your attention, please, to the book of Acts. We preached Sunday from uh, Joshua, talking about Caleb, and we preached from the Acts of the Apostles, talking about Paul and his uh, dilemma in being arrested for uh, sharing the gospel ministry. And, and uh, we touched on this Acts passage a couple of weeks ago when we talked from Acts chapter 28 about uh, the snake that bit Paul uh, while he was on the island of Malta, uh, that a snake bit his hand and people thought he was going to die. He shook the snake off and went on about his business and they ended up thinking that he was a god. Uh, the theme for our messages on Sunday had to do uh, with uh, the idea of determination, uh, that it's important that as Christians uh, we have a strong determination to do the things that God has called for us to do. And so I could have picked Joshua and talked more about Caleb, or I could have picked uh, Acts chapter 22, which is what I decided uh, to lock in on. Uh, so I invite your attention to Acts chapter 22 through uh, the 11th verse of chapter 23. And what I want to focus on is tangential in some ways to, to, to the whole idea of determination, but it helps us to understand where Paul's determination comes from and what he had to fight through with regard to his determination. And it could be helpful to us because in many ways, what Paul was dealing with is what we deal with on a regular basis with regard uh, to the truth of our gospel message uh, going forth in an environment that claims to be Christian, claims to be spiritual, but in many ways falls short. So let me give you a couple of examples of what it is I'm talking about. 87% of those who hold congressional seats in Washington, D.C., whether it be the House of Representatives or the United States Senate, 87% of them claim to be Christian. 87% claim to be Christian. And yet, at this moment, uh, Congress is wiping poor people off of the Medicaid rolls so that they cannot receive proper medical care. Uh, and the only justification for it, when you get through all of the procedural nonsense, is that it costs too much money to keep them on the rolls. During COVID, uh, and I did a little bit of research about this because it's what our staying in prayer segment uh, is going to be about this evening. But during COVID, uh, the, the, the number of people that uh, jumped onto the Medicaid rolls uh, swelled to over 90 million people. And that is 90 million people more than were already on the Medicaid rolls. That, that's during that two and a half year period of time. Now, why did they get on Medicaid rolls? Because they needed Medicaid. That, that, that wasn't a hard question and, and, and it wasn't a riddle. Why, why did they do that? Why, why did they place themselves on those roles? Because they needed 
the coverage. They needed the health care. And the government was providing the health care because there was a pandemic. It was both a, 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 a generous thing to do, but it was also a, a common sense thing to do. If you're always concerned about your national economy and, and, and the ability to keep people working, then you would think that you would want people to uh, have access to health care so that if they get sick, they can get taken care of as quickly as possible and get back to work. It ain't all because they love Jesus. It ain't all because they, they, they just know that it's the spiritual and the right thing to do. But from a practical, pragmatic point of view, you want to keep your uh, 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 health, you, you, you want to keep your, your worker roles as healthy as possible so that your economy can stay strong. But over that two and a half year period of time, what they found out is that it's costing us a whole lot of money. And so they decided in March of this year, I don't know how many people paid any attention to it, they decided in March of this year, 87% of Congress is Christian, or so they claim to be. They decided in March of this year to start wiping people off of the Medicare and Medicaid rolls. And from March through September, 5.6 million people have been taken off of the Medicare and Medicaid rolls. Now, that's more people than get taken off per year prior to this pandemic taking place. You don't have 5.6 million people wiped off in a year's time, but they have done it over the past six months. Texas, our great neighbors to the West, have wiped off 90% of the people from their Medicaid rolls. Florida, our good friends to the east, have wiped off somewhere in the neighborhood of 60% of the people from their Medicaid rolls. And what about our own wonderful state of Louisiana? 50,600 people have been taken off of the Medicaid rolls since March. 87% of the United States Congress claims to be Christian. I would imagine when you look at the Louisiana legislature, that number is probably even higher, probably 90 to 95%. What's my point? My point is everybody who says they're Christian ain't Christian. Everybody who claims to love Jesus, Jesus is their Lord, and, and, and we want to follow the dictates of the gospel. If you're following the dictates of the gospel, then it is evident in your behavior. And where the behavior shows no signs of it, then, then you have to come to a, a different conclusion. You, you, you have to, at some point, decide that maybe they're saying one thing, but they're actually believing something else. Now, to my way of thinking, that's called being a hypocrite. There are a whole lot of hypocritical folk in all aspects. Now, that's just one example. Of what, that, that, that's one political example. There are many others. The point I'm making is this is what Paul was dealing with in Acts chapter 22. 20, it, it actually starts in Acts chapter 21. But what, what he is dealing with is the hypocrisy that existed in Orthodox Judaism. It wasn't about Christians. In his case, it was about Orthodox Jews. But the point I'm making is, just like Paul was dealing with hypocrisy in the text, the church has to deal with hypocrisy on a daily 
basis. Not everybody who comes to church on Sunday loves Jesus. Not everybody cares about the plan of salvation. Not everybody believes in agape love. We bring so much of our culture and our history and our personal experience and our personal biases with us into the church and we prop them up by finding a scripture or two that supports the position that we hold or we make it support the position that we hold. But what we don't do is allow Jesus to actually convert and transform us into who he would have us to be. And when you run against that, at some point, those who actually espouse Jesus become threats to the orthodox status quo that holds power, that holds sway. In Paul's case, in, in, in the Acts of the Apostles, and, and we told much of this story a couple of, of weeks ago, Paul was asked to do something by James, uh, the brother of Jesus, the, the author of the epistle of James that's in our uh, New Testament canon, uh, and the recognized leader of the Jerusalem church. Paul made his way back to Jerusalem. He carried gifts with him from the various uh, outlying churches where he had been ministering, primarily non-Jewish or what we uh, have known to be called Gentile uh, Christians who sent gifts back to the Jerusalem church. Paul brought them together and, and shared the gifts with James and the other elders of the Jerusalem church, told them about the wonderful work that the Lord was doing in the lives of those people. And they all said, Paul, that's wonderful news. That's good. We're, we celebrate what's going on. Now, we got an issue we need to talk to you about. In other words, we, they really weren't concerned about what Paul was sharing with them. They had their own agenda. Look, look in your Bible. Turn back to Acts chapter 21, starting with verse 17. I'm reading from the message version. In Jerusalem, our friends, glad to see us, received us with open arms. The first thing next morning, we took Paul to see James. All the church leaders were there. After a time of greeting and small talk, Paul told the story, detail by detail, of what God had done among the non-Jewish people through his ministry. They listened with delight and gave God the glory. They had a story to tell, too. And just look at what's been happening here. Thousands and thousands of God-fearing Jews have become believers in Jesus. But, you see that? But, there's also a problem because they are more zealous than ever in observing the laws of Moses. They've been told that you advise believing Jews who live surrounded by unbelieving outsiders to go light on Moses, telling them that they don't need to circumcise their children or keep up the old traditions. This isn't sitting at all well with them. Now, let's identify the problem. The problem that presents itself here is that those who were a part of the Jerusalem church were not willing 
to stand solely on the gospel, but were willing to compromise in order to make the gospel more palatable to those who were there. And when you do that, when you take the gospel and make it more palatable to those who are there, what you are doing is you are compromising the gospel for the culture in which you live. Look at it again. They've been told that you advise believing Jews who live surrounded by unbelieving outsiders to go light on Moses. That is, that you don't have to pay attention to the Old Testament covenantal law, that you don't have to circumcise your, your children. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you have to circumcise your children to be a believer? Do you have to follow the Mosaic covenant in order to be a believer? So what did Paul say that was wrong? What, what is it that they are accusing Paul of that Paul has done that is wrong? Let's be clear. What they're saying Paul did, Paul did. That's not the issue. The issue is not did Paul do it. The issue is was Paul wrong? in doing it? The answer is no. You are not a Christian because you keep the law of Moses. Any of them. You are not a Christian because you live by the Ten Commandments. Because I know some of y'all just love the Ten Commandments. You, you, you are not a Christian because you keep the Ten Commandments. And let me say this very quickly behind that. You ought to be glad that you're not a Christian because you keep the Ten Commandments. Because if that were the case, we all on our way to hell. Nobody, don't care how righteous you think you are, Nobody can keep the Ten Commandments. We all flunk if it's about keeping the Ten Commandments. So there, there is nothing that Paul did or said that was wrong. He did what they said he had done. But James and the others were saying, in teaching the gospel the way that you have, pure and true, you've caused a cultural problem for us in this particular setting where we are. You're making it difficult for us to live comfortable lives. Think about what I'm saying. You're making it difficult for us to live comfortable lives because you're preaching the truth of the gospel. And we want you to help us fix it. We want you to soften your position in order to help us fix it. Because they had a solution. Look at verse 22, chapter 21. We're worried about what will happen when they discover you're in town. There's bound to be trouble. So here's what we want you to do. There are four men from our company who have, been, who have taken a vow involving ritual purification, but have no money to pay the expenses. Join these men in their vows and pay their expenses, then it will become obvious to everyone that there is nothing to the rumors going around about you and that you are in fact scrupulous in your reverence for the laws 
of Moses. Keep reading. In asking you to do this, we're not going back on our agreement regarding non-Jews who have become believers. We continue to hold fast to what we wrote in that letter, namely to be careful not to get involved in activities connected with idols, to avoid serving food events offensive to Jewish Christians, to guard the morality of sex and marriage. In other words, we're not asking you to, 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 to we're not saying that we're gonna compromise on anything that we have already said that we are willing to do, but we want you to compromise for us. There were other options available. And I don't know why James and the others didn't see the other options. And I don't know why Paul didn't see the other options. But nobody exercised the options that were available. What options are you talking about? Well, let's start with option number one. You can leave. People ain't happy that you're here. So maybe you ought to pack your bags and go. That's what they did when, 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 when Paul was in, in Damascus. After Paul got converted, the text says that he started preaching the gospel and he made folks so mad that they had to lower him out of the window of the wall in a basket in the middle of the night to get him out of town. But you, but you know what they did? They got him out of town. James could have said, we appreciate the gift, we appreciate the message, and, and, and now it's time for you to leave. Paul could have said, I ain't going to do that, but, but maybe it's time for me to pick up my stuff and go. It is not the worst thing in the world that people of goodwill, people of sincere intention, will sometimes have disagreements and decide that it's better that they go their own way. It happened earlier in Paul's ministry. When, when Paul was with Barnabas, there was uh, a, a proposal brought by Barnabas to go out on a second missionary journey and go back and check on the churches that we had been serving, that we served the first time, check on those areas and see how things were going. And Paul said, okay, let's go. And Barnabas said, okay, I'll bring John Mark with us. And he said, no, John Mark ain't coming. John Mark can't come with us. Well, why can't John Mark come with us? Well, you know what happened the last time John Mark came. John Mark got homesick and, and he left us in a lurch and he ran back home, and I ain't willing to deal with John Mark anymore. And the scripture says that their disagreement became so heated, so, so deep, that they decided to go their separate ways. Barnabas took John Mark and went one way. Paul hooked up with a fellow named Silas, and they went another way. And the gospel grew. So, sometimes it's better if we leave other folk alone than, than, than to simply seek to prevail upon them. I don't know why James and the elders of the church in Jerusalem didn't say, thank you for the gift, you need to leave. I don't know why Paul didn't say, I brought the gift, I've given you my report, I'm going to go. But neither one came to that conclusion. James and the, and, and the leaders of the church in Jerusalem asked Paul to make an accommodation on the gospel message that he was preaching by engaging in a purification ceremony, and Paul agreed to do so. From my point of view, and you can disagree if you like, you, you have every right to, from my point of view, they were wrong for asking, and Paul was wrong for accepting. 
you don't change the gospel to accommodate other people or to accommodate culture. The gospel is what it is. Now, what's important for us to understand is that we all have an appropriate understanding of what the gospel is. I started by talking about the fact that 87% of Congress claims to be Christian and yet they're taking people off church rolls, which clearly says to me, not church rolls, sick rolls, which clearly says to me that while we all claim something, we're not all living what we claim. It is not Jesus to put money ahead of sick people. We have sent I don't know how many billions of dollars to Ukraine to help them fight against Russia but we can't use dollars to help make sick people well. We can't use dollars to make hungry people full. There's something wrong. There is no Jesus in that. Jesus tells a parable in Matthew chapter 25 where he, where he says that people are separated into two groups. It says one group is called sheep, the other group called goats. And he says to the sheep, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was sick and in prison, you came to see about me. When I was naked, you clothed me. And the question comes back, when did we see you this way? And, and, and the response that the master gives is, whenever you did this to the least, you did it to me. And to the others, he says, when I was hungry, you didn't give me anything to eat. When I was sick and in prison, you didn't come to visit me. When I was naked, you didn't give me any clothing. When I was without shelter, you did not invite me in. And they asked the same question. When did we see you this way? And the answer is the same. When you failed to do it to the least, you failed to do it to me. My point is, we can claim to be something. But our behavior tells the truth about what we claim, whether it's genuine or it's not. And we have to be careful because there are a whole lot of people around us, and I ain't just talking about the white evangelical conservative folk. There are folk right in and around us who ain't got no Jesus in them. They, 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 they simply don't have any real concern about the needs of people. And where we lack agape, love without limit and without restriction, we dilute the truth of the gospel. In Paul's case, it wasn't a matter of a lack of love. It was a matter of yielding to a cultural bias that was prevailing within that particular community. And we cannot allow the gospel to yield to cultural biases where we somehow stop standing on the truth of the gospel. I believe in water baptism. I believe in baptism by immersion. I believe in baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Dip them down, bring them back up. But I got sense enough to know ain't nobody saved because you got wet in the pool. 
Some folk go down, messed up, and come back up just as messed up as they were. Only difference is now they wet. I believe in the Lord's Supper. I believe in, in sharing in the Lord's Supper. I don't believe that there's any conveyance of grace. I, you know, we don't, as Baptists, we don't believe in sacraments. Uh, we don't believe that there's an activity that we share in that conveys a, a special dispensation of grace upon the participant, which is what a sacrament is. But I do believe in, in identifying with the suffering of Christ by taking of the bread and the wine. But I don't believe that if you missed being here on the first Sunday and you didn't get your bread and wine and you die that Sunday night, that somehow or other that disqualifies you from heaven. And, and, and you're laughing, but I'm telling you, there's a reason why there are more people here on first Sunday than there is on third. Order of service is the same. The length of time that we're here is essentially the same, especially now the way that we're conducting the, the Lord's Supper. So what, what accounts for the difference in the number of people? You have allowed yourselves to believe that I need that bread and that wine. And if I don't get it, Lord help if something happens to me and It's culture. It's culture. And, 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 and the gospel is, 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 should not be relegated to culture. Can I say something else? Well, while, while I'm making folk mad, I'm not making none of y'all mad, but there's somebody watching me. Uh, uh, I'm going to get an email at some point. Uh, uh, but, 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 if you take the bread and the wine, but you still cussing folk out after you've had the bread and the wine, the bread and the wine didn't help. If you still digging ditches for folk and gossiping about folk, as you take the bread and the wine, and the bread and the wine ain't helping you a whole lot. We have to be careful about falling in love with symbols and not falling in love with Christ. We have to be careful about making accommodations to culture and not standing on the truth of the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is accepting him as both Savior and Lord. And while most of us, almost none of us, have any problem with Jesus as Savior, a whole lot of us have problems with Jesus as Lord. We believe that he died for our sins, and that he rose on the third day, praise the Lord, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. He rose with all power in his hands. And we can't say thank you, Jesus, enough. But when he says, love your enemies and bless those who curse you and do good to them that hate you and pray for them that use you and persecute you and turn the other cheek and walk the second mile and give up your coat when they sue you for your cloak and forgive them as you have been forgiven. We got problems. 
we have problems. So it's not the savior aspect that, 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 that messes us up. It's the lordship aspect that messes us up. What James and the elders of the church of Jerusalem should have told the Jewish leaders is the gospel doesn't require the maintenance of the Mosaic Covenant. And we're not going to say that it does just to make you happy. But they chose not to do that. What Paul should have said was, I'm sorry that it's caused y'all a problem, but it's your problem, not my problem. And I'm not going to make it my problem by doing what you want me to do. But Paul didn't say that. Paul did. Y'all like Paul, so I got I, I to gotta make Paul seem softer for y'all. What Paul did was say, I'm going to humble myself to what you have asked, and I'm going to do it even though I don't believe that I need to do it. I don't believe that I should do it. That, that make y'all feel better about what, 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 what Paul did? What Paul did, that's right. He got along. He went along to get along. And what Paul should have done was pick up his stuff and leave town. That's what he should have done. So all of this happens. And, and, and what happens as a result is a riot breaks out. Look at verse 27 of Acts chapter 21. When the seven days of their purification were nearly up, some Jews from around Ephesus spotted him in the temple. At once they turned the place upside down. They grabbed Paul and started yelling at the top of their lungs, help, you Israelites, help. This is the man who's, getting, who's going all over the world telling lies against us and our religion and this place. He's even brought Greeks in here and defiled this holy place. What had happened was that they had seen Paul with Trophimus, the Ephesian Greek, walking together in the city and had just assumed that he had also taken him to the temple and shown him around. In other words, they lied. That, 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 that's a whole lot of words that simply mean they lied. And then they started a riot. Soon, the whole city was in an uproar, people running from everywhere to the temple to get in on the action. They grabbed Paul, dragged him outside, and locked the temple gate so he couldn't get back in and gain sanctuary. As they were trying to kill him, word came to the captain of the guard. A riot, the whole city's boiling over. He acted swiftly. His soldiers and centurions ran to the scene at once. As soon as the mob saw the captain and his soldiers, they quit beating Paul. The captain came up and put Paul under arrest. He first ordered him handcuffed and then asked who he was and what he had done. All he got from the crowd was shouts, one yelling this, another that. It was impossible to tell one word from another in the mob hysteria. So the captain ordered Paul taken to the military barracks. But when they got to the temple steps, the mob became so violent that the soldiers had to carry Paul. As they carried him away, the crowd followed, shouting, kill him, kill him. When they got to the barracks and were about to go in, Paul said to the captain, can I say something to you? He answered, oh, I didn't know you spoke Greek. I thought you were the Egyptian who not long ago started a riot here and then hid out in the desert with his 4,000 thugs. Paul said, no, I'm a Jew born in Tarsus, and I'm a citizen still of that influential city. I have a simple request. Let me speak to the crowd standing on the barrack steps. Paul turned and held his arms up. A hush fell over the crowd as Paul began to speak. He spoke in Hebrew. I want you to see that. Paul, in addressing the Roman gods, spoke in Greek. 
But when he got ready to address the mob, he spoke in Hebrew. Why did he shift languages? Because Paul was smart enough to know that in order to communicate properly and effectively, I have to speak in a language that you will appreciate and understand. I said this Sunday, I will say it again today. If the church is really going to affect people, then the church has to learn how to speak in a language that people can appreciate and understand. This idea of we're going to speak the way we've always spoken and we're going to do what we've always done and everybody else is just going to catch up with us, it doesn't work. And it's at least one explanation for why the church continues to lag behind in reaching the world for Christ. Can I, can I say this to you? The church ain't about you. The church is about Jesus. And this, we've always done it this way, that's about you. That ain't about Jesus. I came from a church back in the country, and we always did that. That's about you. That ain't about Jesus. My mom and my daddy always did that. That's about you. I want you to notice when you talk how much of it is about you as opposed to being about Jesus. Paul knew that to get the attention of the guard, he needed to speak in a language that the guard would appreciate. He knew when he spoke to the mob, to the mob, to the mob, he had to speak in a language that they would appreciate, that they would stand up and take attention and appreciate. And if the church is to deal with the chaotic situations that exist in our world today, the chaos that exists in various segments of our community, then the church has to learn how to speak in a language that these various segments can understand, appreciate, and respond to. Changing the language does not change the tone or the substance of the message. It just means that we have put it in a packaging that people can appreciate and understand. And if the church is unwilling to do that, then the church will continue to become obsolete in the minds and hearts of our community. Less than 40% of American people go to church on a regular basis. Less than 40%. Six in 10 of American people find something else to do on Sunday rather than come to church. Now, you can sit in here and cuss all them folk who pass by and don't bother to come in. You can sit in here and you can declare, they all going to hell. You can do that if you want to. But when you do that, understand this, that ain't about Jesus, that's about you. That's about you being so mad and so disappointed that people won't respond to what you want them to respond to. That you're, you, you've lost sight 
of what the gospel is about. The gospel ain't about you. If the pandemic didn't teach me anything else, it taught me this. Church can go on without anybody. For two and a half years, I came in here on Sunday morning and preached to these pews. Cause that's, that's what was here, these pews. I used to hear my daddy talk about when he got called to preach and how he was a guard over the airplanes in, in Fairford, England. I even remember the name of the place, Fairford, England. And, 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 and he would find himself out there guarding planes at one and two o'clock in the morning, he found himself preaching to the plains. Well, I couldn't really relate to that. I understood it, I smiled at it, I, I, I drew some kind of inspiration from it, but I couldn't really relate to that until I walked in here twice every Sunday and on Wednesday and talked to Pew. That's all that was here. Had a couple of musicians over there, had, had a couple of audiovisual people up there, but I was talking to pews. And do you know what the church did over that two and a half year period of time? It did just fine. Because God blessed the church. God blessed you. I don't discount the fact that you continue to support your church even in your absence. I'm, I'm not dismissing that at all. But what it helped me to understand is the church could be full with no seats left vacant, or the church could be as empty as it was for those two and a half years. God's church is going to go on. It's going to go on. You think... Not you, somebody watching me, not, nobody looking at me. You think that the church can't get along without you. Well, Shiloh was organized in 1872. I don't think none of y'all were here in 1872 church got along just fine. Give it a couple of years. It ain't going to take long. Give it a couple of years. That spot you sitting in now, that's going to be somebody else's spot. And the church is going to get along just fine. Because God will take care of his church. Every now and then somebody comes and they say, well, you know, we don't have as many people as we once had. You're right. We don't. Some of them found someplace else to go. Some of them went on, as we preachers like to say, to try the realities of another world. But you know what's still here? Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church. And we're doing just fine. We're continuing to evangelize the lost, disciple the saved, and minister to the needs of hurting people. Because the church is bigger than us. Paul recognized what was going on, and he used this opportunity to go back and minister to people who were trying to kill him. That's the last thing I'm going to say because I'm almost out of time. You want to have a good measurement of your commitment, of your determination? 
Be determined to minister to people who are trying to kill you. Be committed to ministering to people who are trying to kill you. They had to carry him out because people were trying to kill him. And when he stops, he says, let me go back in and talk to him again. And what is it that he talks to them about? Jesus. He doesn't talk to them about himself. He doesn't talk to him to them about how stellar a person he is. He talks to them about Jesus. If the church doesn't stay on point and talk about Jesus, then the church will fail in its assignment. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. The Word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. And we beheld His glory full of grace and truth. He came to His own. His own did not receive him. But to as many as received him, he gave them the power to become the sons and daughters of God. That's the message of the church. That's the gospel. That, that, that's what we have to share even with those who are trying to kill us, even with those who are trying to alter our message, even with those who are trying to pull us off in a different direction, carry us down a different path. You know, Satan tried to carry Jesus down a different path. Satan knew that he couldn't stop Jesus. So he, he decided that the best chance he had was to carry Jesus down a different path. That's what the whole temptation experience was about. He, he, he presented Jesus with options as to how he could carry out his assignment. And Jesus rejected each and every option because Jesus knew that wasn't what the Lord wanted me to do. We have to be as discerning and as committed as Jesus was. We have to be as discerning and as committed as Paul is in this text. We have to say, I know what I have been called to do, and I am not going to allow myself to be carried off in any direction other than the one that Christ has laid out for me. If it means that I die doing this, then let me die. Y'all love Paul, right? For me to live is Christ. For me to die is gain. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is a crown of righteousness 
awaiting me that the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day and not to me only, but to all who love his appearing. You didn't think you were going to get out of here alive, did you? You do recognize that all of us are going to have to die at some point. If I'm going to die, I might as well die doing what the Lord called me to do. Lord God, thank you for this time of sharing. We pray that what has been said and done here has been pleasing in your sight, edifying to your people, uplifting to your holy and righteous name. Bless us as we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. These very same people are the quickest to cry racism at the slightest provocation or for no reason at all. There's no systemic racism. There is no law. There is nothing that says that I can't do something as a black person that you can do. We're honoring all of the great white men who are being smeared and defamed and torn down. Back in the late 1980s through the mid-1990s, many Christians wore bands on their wrists that contained the abbreviation WWJD, What Would Jesus Do? Though it was popularized in those years, WWJD got its start nearly a century earlier. In 1897, a Kansas preacher and author, Charles Sheldon, put together a book entitled In His Steps, What Would Jesus Do? The book has sold over 30 million copies. It is widely believed that Sheldon is the one responsible for the popularity of the phrase, and it's a good phrase, but it's not a phrase without problems. Among other things, the phrase suggests that Christians agree on what Jesus would do in every situation, but evidence is clear that such agreement does not exist. Christians of goodwill disagree on abortion, on LGBTQ plus rights, on the death penalty, on climate change and the environment, on law enforcement, on the role and control of public education, and that's just to name a few. Recently, I was reminded that Christians also disagree on health care, namely the role of the government to provide adequate health care for all of its citizens. Americans boast that we provide the highest standard of health care known to humanity, which is not true. According to CommonwealthFund.org, Despite having the most expensive health care in the world, the USA ranks behind Australia, Canada, Germany, the Netherlands, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom on measures of quality, efficiency, access to care, equity, and the ability to lead long, healthy lives. So how do state governments plan to address this reality? By removing people from the Medicaid rolls and denying them adequate health care access. For Lauren W. Relaford, political director at Sojourners Magazine, the question is not what would Jesus do, but who would Jesus remove from Medicaid? Writes Relaford, early in my political advocacy career, I assumed that as a Christian, I'd have an easier time of this since more than 87% of Congress claims to share my Christian faith. But since then, I've learned a serious lesson about the limitations of the Christian imagination in politics. Despite the faith we share, many lawmakers in this country don't seem to envision a country where we actually put these values into practice. My latest disappointment? Millions of people losing Medicaid coverage, our nation's primary public health system that provides health care and support for folks with low income and or disabilities because states refuse to do the right thing. At the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, Congress put into place protections for people enrolled in Medicaid to ensure that they were able to stay covered while the country was under a public health emergency. This policy, known as the continuous coverage requirement, allowed states to receive additional federal money for their Medicaid programs in exchange for not kicking people out of the program for as long as the country remained under a federal public health emergency. The policy, which serves more than 90 million people, represents the kind of good work that Jesus would be proud of. Writes Relaford, it is a testament to the value we place on humanity because we are made in the image of God and therefore treat each other in a manner befitting of the Spirit. 
Moreover, providing health care coverage to as many people as possible amid a highly contagious, airborne, and deadly pandemic is also just common sense from a purely capitalist perspective. Healthy people translate to a thriving labor force and a thriving economy, an idea supported by decades of research. Preventing people from getting seriously ill, permanently disabled, and or unable to work at their full capacity is vital to our economic well-being and national security survival. But it seems that some states have neither Christian goodness nor capitalist common sense. On March 31st of this year, Congress severed the link that made additional Medicare fun funding dependent on keeping people enrolled and ended the continuous coverage requirement, regardless of whether the COVID-19 health emergency was in effect. States were tasked with unwinding the continuous coverage requirement by reviewing the eligibility of every person enrolled in Medicaid in their state and either renewing or removing them from the program. Writes Relaford, given that Medicaid enrollment grew enormously during the pandemic, increasing over 30% from 64 million in January 2020 to 85 million by late 2022, one would think state Medicaid agencies would begin preparing for the bureaucratic nightmare of making coverage determinations for millions of people. One would also think that state Medicaid agencies would have begun creating a process to ensure millions of people did not erroneously lose coverage, acting with integrity and morality because they're dealing with human lives. One would be wrong. A month before continuous coverage ended, eight states started kicking people off their Medicaid rolls. According to data from the Kaiser Family Foundation, more than 5.6 million people have lost health care coverage through Medicaid. That's a figure that far surpasses the number of people who normally lose coverage annually. In many states, well over a quarter of Medicaid enrollees have been terminated or determined ineligible. In Texas, that number is more than 60%. In Florida, where it's 30%, families are suing, saying that they were removed without due process. Julie O'Donohue of the Louisiana Illuminator reported last month that Louisiana removed 50,600 people from government-funded Medicaid health insurance as part of the program's disenrollment process. The Department of Health and Human Services predicts that as many as 15 million people will ultimately lose coverage. More than 60% of those who lose coverage will be Black, Latin, Asian, American, Pacific Islander, or multiracial, further exacerbating our already poor health care outcomes and treatment. According to Kaiser, 73% of those disenrolled are being removed through a process called procedural terminations, which is when states mail out Medicaid renewal forms, never hear back, and thus remove someone. There is a problematic process because once someone is removed, they must go through significant bureaucratic processes to try to get back on Medicaid, an application process that's already plenty difficult. Writes Relaford, the hoops this country makes the most deserving jump through to get the things they need is appalling and shameful, with state Medicaid agencies largely to blame. Medicaid is administered by states, with the federal government providing oversight and additional funding. This means that each state has enormous power and flexibility to determine who to cover, what services and treatments to provide, how to deliver care, and how much to reimburse providers. This gives state health officials extraordinary power to determine who is deserving or poor enough to be eligible to receive Medicaid. Although the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services is responsible for Medicaid program administration at the federal level, individual state Medicaid agencies establish many policies and manage their own programs on a day-to-day -day basis. This is due to federal law, which requires each state to designate a single state agency to administer and or supervise the administration of its Medicaid program. This structure gives state politicians the power to decide who is entitled to receive it based on ineligibility requirements, creating space for states to decide that people aren't poor enough, sick enough, or deserving enough based on their own subjective criteria. In her conclusion, Relaford writes, 
When I look at the value judgments behind these decisions, I see states trying to decide whose suffering matters, who's worthy of help and support. I can't pretend to understand these values. My own faith teaches me that everyone is worthy of love, care, and concern, with extra special attention to help those who are most vulnerable. My faith allows me to imagine a nation where if anyone lacks clothes or food, we give them the things they need. And my faith empowers me to make this vision a reality on earth as it is in heaven, knowing that when one person suffers, we all suffer. And when one rejoices, we all share in the joy. I wish Christian lawmakers felt the same way. This is something we should pray about. Lord God, we thank you for being the Lord who heals. In this time of political tribalism and economic needs taking precedence over the provision of quality health care, we commit the American health care system to you. And we ask that you would let justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream for the sake of all our people. We thank you for every health care professional, and we ask that they will seek your wisdom and knowledge in always pursuing excellence in their chosen fields. Let them be dedicated to the proper care and treatment of their patients and remember to show their patients mercy just as you have shown compassion to them. Your word teaches us, dear God, that you detest the use of dishonest scales, but you delight in accurate weights. So we rebuke the spirits of greed and injustice within the halls of government local, state, and national that has prevented many Americans from being able to access quality health care that will meet their families' needs without bankrupting their budgets. Your word admonishes that everything should be done properly and in order. And so we ask, dear God, that you would command upon the American health care system that they line up with your word and do what is right in your name. We ask it in the name of Jesus, who is our Christ. Amen.